Hello, this is Daryl Ehrlich, and this is the Vietnam Voices series, a project of the Billings Gazette, sponsored by Master Lube. It is October 9th, 2015. Today, I am joined in the studio. I'm very excited about this story because it's a. We've heard some other guys talk about uh, talk about it, but we have a, a guy in the studio today, Gunnar Hagstrom, who is with the U.S. Army from 1968 to 1971, who actually, I, I'm not going to steal his thunder, but but did something incredibly interesting that I don't think a lot of people realize about the war, but I'm going to let him talk about it. Gunnar, thanks for being with me today. I really appreciate it. It's good to be here. Good to have you. Let's talk about, so you went in the Army in 1968, but let's talk about life before 1968. Where were you? What were you doing? I moved to Billings when I was four years old, which was, it's, let's call it about the spring of 54. Uh, I was born in 49. And uh, we moved to Billings, my father and my mother and a couple of my uh, sisters um, at that time and grew up in Billings. Uh, graduated from senior high in 67. Uh, grew up in Alkali Creek um, for most of that part, in fact, all of it. And, um, and then, like I said, we, I joined the service in the Christmas of 68, say a year and a half after graduating from high school. Okay, why'd you join? Well, um, I grew up in Alkali Creek, and uh, the, the land that we had um, was bordered on the northern edge of the airport. And so I literally, in so many ways, uh, grew up at the airport. Uh, it was my love flying and stuff. Not that I had any opportunity to fly, but back then the airport was, you know, had a three or four strand barbed wire fence, and it was very easy to go and hang, the, hang out for the day or whatever up at the airport. And I did a lot of that. So growing up, I was in love with flying. And uh, so anyway, it would, you know, I just, I loved flying. And I didn't have any idea what I would get to do eventually. But Vietnam came along, and, you know, I graduated. And that was, um, then all of a sudden, I was no good at school, barely graduated from high school, and academically wise. And so, and I needed to do something, I needed some direction, and the Army had basically said, you know, they'd send me to flight school. I, um, they, I took their big test, had no problem uh, passing it with flying colors. They said, yes, we'll send you to flight school. And so I took off about Christmas time, 68, to go to flight school. Mm -hmm. so the love of flying, the opportunity, either Vietnam and the Army, saying, you know, and they needed plenty of warrant officers, and so I volunteered with the guarantee that after flight school I'd go do a year of tour over in Nam. So did that pro did the prospect of going to Nam worry you at all? Because it's a war. Well, yeah, but, you know, at that time I was convinced that the Vietnam War was a proper war in the idea that between uh, China and Russia and North Vietnam, the communists were basically taking over that whole part of the world. And my way of thinking at that time was that we were, you know, slowing down or stopping the movement of communism. And, you know, so there was a reason for me to go, you know, as far as being patriotic, as far as going to fight for my country. And so, sure, there was a concern, but. Um, you know, I don't remember much of a concern. Right. Did your parents, uh, did you come from a military family? Were your parents worried? Did they support? What were, were, were they? They what supported, was it? yeah. Dad was actually uh, a surgeon here at the Billings Clinic, and he, after uh, graduating from Columbia, being married, having a couple kids, he ended up over in uh, South Korea as a uh, marine uh, surgeon, kind of like the MASH mm -hmm. uh, situation. That's what he did for 12 or 13 months. And so he was over there when I was probably two and three years old or something of that sort. So yes, he was uh, uh, in the military uh, okay. for, for the Marines. Okay. Uh, he didn't hold it uh, against you that you joined the Army? Say again? He didn't hold it against you that you joined the Army? No, 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 no not in the least, not okay. in the least. I mean, it was, you know, I, I didn't care what I joined as long as I got to fly. fly. And, all the other services required some college, and I had no college. So, okay. you know, so anyway, the, arm, our, 
the Army was really my only option. Right. So where did you do basic, and, and then where was flight school? I did basic uh, from 1st of January through uh, the end of uh, February, uh, Fort Polk, Louisiana. And then immediately I went over to um, Mirror Wells, Texas, which is about 50 miles uh, wet, uh, yeah, west of Fort Worth, Texas, for the first half of flight school. And in probably four months of, of flying, four and a half, you know, I got probably 125 hours of the smaller turbine, or rather, piston helicopters as far as the training is concerned. Okay. And then I had a, probably two weeks at home and then went right to um, the second half, Fort Rucker, Alabama, where we did the instrument training and f learned to fly the Hueys, the, the A and B model Hueys, the oldest original um, models and graduated on around 25th of January of 70. So within a year of, basically a year and 24 days, you had gone from basic to, yeah. to learn how to fly. Yeah, exactly, it was, you know. What, what, what's it like, we've heard from some pilots, uh, a fixed wing, but we haven't, and we've talked to one, I think one helicopter um, pilot, what's what's learning to fly helicopters like? Because you you've flown both uh, air, airplane and helicopter. What's flying helicopter like? What do you have to know about that versus, say, an airplane? Well, I sure didn't know much. I know I re read one book um, before I went into flight school about helicopters. You know what made them or how how they flew, actual, and that type. Just kind of a basic book to kind of equate myself. So going into flight school, they actually preferred you really not to have much of any experience at all so they could train you from the bottom up. And that was definitely my case. And uh, so it took the first months you were of flight school was just officer training and that sort of stuff. And then you started flying the second month. And uh, by the end of that month, uh, you were uh, able to hover which is actually just come off the ground, fly around in a, in a traffic pattern, and come to approach and and be able to control the aircraft. Uh, didn't know much. You just were able to fly. To do that with the instructor not helping you. <laughs> so <laughs> I can imagine uh, poor instructors. I've uh, now that I've heard enough about it, that could have been a harrowing job as teaching someone to fly in the yeah. military. I mean, they're very good at themselves uh, with what they they did. They were, you know, a lot of them were Vietnam veterans coming back, so they were. It was, you know, you just stay on top of it. And in most cases, were so ambitious about learning and whatever. They were so focused. And granted, you you do make mistakes, but they're right there, and they expect it. You know, a person can only make so many different kinds of mistakes. Uh, each individual young learning right. pilot that you know. They've seen it many times, and so they're anticipating whatever mistakes I was making at the at the moment or the the time of learning. Yeah. So uh, January 25th, you graduate from flight school. Then, do you have orders to go right to Vietnam, or where? Yeah, where we left with orders, and uh, I basically had five weeks at home, or maybe four, because I. Uh, there was a few days of traveling, but I went to California and then straight over to, uh, from Japan to, to Vietnam, which probably just took a couple days yeah. of traveling. What did you do in those, uh, what do you do for four or five weeks when you don't, when you know, listen, my next stop is Vietnam? Well, I was already married and, you know, I was skiing and, you know, I don't really remember a lot about it. It was just something that I knew I was headed for. There was, I'm sure, some sort of an excitement in the anticipation of what it might be. And at the age of 20 years old, going to Vietnam, you're pretty young and naive and and maybe there's some cockiness, you know, sure. whatever. Um, I mean, you've been trained, you're doing what you're wanting to do, you, you've made a commitment and you're headed that way. So eventually the calendar shows up and then you're gone and you're headed for was it hard being, I mean, a, a lot of the guys who are going over a single year married, did that weigh any differently on you? I mean. I don't remember. Okay. You know, I'd only been married for a couple months. Okay. So, anyway. so you go over, and where do you land in Vietnam, and what are your first impressions of Vietnam? Well, 
I don't remember much. Uh, it was just outside of uh, Saigon, I believe, where we, we landed. And I remember the um, landing at night um, and the smells and the, the humidity, uh, that sort of stuff. And probably the next day we traveled to the north, I ended up uh, at a place called Fubai, which is in northern i -Cor. There was four cores, four, three, two, and one, and I was in northern i uh, a place called Fubai, north of Da Nang, is where I, my bed was for the next year. Okay. And what did it look like? I mean, give me a lay of the, for people who've not been there, don't know what Vietnam looks like, what did it look like to you? Well, Fubai was, um, had an airstrip, a uh, pretty good, decent one. They had a lot of fixed wing running in and out and quite a bit of helicopters there. It's a very flat land, uh, a lot of uh, rice paddies all the way around it uh, within a f three or four miles of the ocean. Um, and then immediately to the west and to the south, we had the foot foothills and it was instantly triple canopy jungle as far as you could go clear into Laos. I mean, it was just, it was solid jungle from, you know, just west of Fubai to forever. Right, right. So you get there, and uh, what's your first uh, day or so on the ground? What do they have you do? What do you remember of that, just uh, being a new arrival? Well, probably the, one of the first things was, because of my stature, as far as being a smaller person, uh, I was perfect to, size-wise to, to fly uh, what the Army called a loach, which was uh, built by the Hughes Tool Company, known as a, a Hughes uh, 500. It was the A and B models that we were in, the first or original ones, but we referred to it as a loach, uh, LOH, low-level observation helicopter. And I volunteered for it uh, just because it sounded exciting, it looked good, I, the, um, you know, I just, and these are, are these are pi these are smaller. This is a small. Is it piston driven helicopter? It, it would normally carry, let's say, four people max, a pilot, and somebody else in the left seat, and then had enough room for two people in the back. And but um, the Loach mission was basically pilot, single pilot, an observer, and um, and then a crew chief in the back. We had flew with the doors off but we were constantly low level, uh, you know, hunting Charlie, and I can kind of get into that later, but uh, that was the mission that I was had chosen. And so once you chose that, they, they gave you about a week's worth of training. Okay. And uh, so I would go out and fly as an observer with a, 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 a pilot that had quite a few months, you know, a senior uh, loach pilot and get kind of the lay of the land and just how the mission went and how you fl flew that aircraft and that kind of stuff. And so in one week, you were kind of force-fed everything along with, uh, you're training yourself, flying your check rides and that kind of stuff to, to get yourself qualified to actually fly the aircraft. And so there was a combination that first week or so where you were both flying out in the AO, which would mean area of operation. So and then the training and that kind of stuff. Was this, so had you been trained on the Loach in? No, nope. not, so. I had never gotten close to one, I don't believe, I don't remember what, I don't I don't think so. It was, I knew about it and knew the mission, but I sure as heck didn't no, have what any, ex any experience. What was what was the uh, aircraft itself like? What are the characteristics? Is this, is this I imagine it handles a lot different than a Huey, a UH-1 or another? Yeah, it's a pretty small aircraft and it, um, very fast, very responsive. It was a four-bladed system uh, on the main rotor and very quick uh, as far as responsiveness. I referred to it the whole year and have since as I referred to it as a Porsche in the air as far as the way it handled. Very maneuverable and that's why it was so good with the mission. It was also, Howard Hughes did a phenomenal job of building this aircraft as far as crashability, as far as surviving a crash. Uh, they built it very well, and it handled crashes quite well. Um, had a great safety record, and uh, it was just, it was fun to uh, fly. Uh, in reality, I didn't turn 21 until, um, 
what, 11 days after I got to country. So therefore, by the time I turned 21, I had already been given my aircraft and I was out flying in the AO, AO myself wow. as a brand new span, you know. Right. Um, so anyway. How, how many other Loach pilots were there uh, that you were with over there in uh, The company Dubai? that I was in, uh, assigned to was the 2nd of 17th Air Cav. And an air cav unit had three different aircraft. They had about 10 Hueys for troop carrying. Um, and then they had about 10 uh, Cobras of, uh, as gunships. And then they had approximately 10 Loaches, um, which I was getting involved in. And so therefore, we were basically a scout unit where we would go out and, and hunt Charlie on a continuous base. My mission was would go out and I'd have two or three Cobras on top of me following me and watching me what I was doing and listening to what I was observing um, each day. And now let's, for people who don't understand, I, I get where um, your job, because I, I think it's amazing, it's one of the reasons that I'm really excited, your job is to go out and get them to fire back. I mean, to get that, to see where they are and see if you can draw them out. That's inherently, that would seem to be a pretty dangerous thing. You're, act, you're going out almost asking for trouble in a very small aircraft up in the air right above, right above the canopy. That's risky business. Our mission as the Loach was not, uh, was more defensive than uh, uh, being aggressive as far as, uh, you know, shooting or whatever. Mm -hmm. That's, we were just there to ob observe. My muscle and, and clout was the Cobras that were on top of me. Mm -hmm. And uh, yes, it was, mission was to go out and hunt Charlie. And the environment that we were working in was all triple canopy jungle for the most part. So you really didn't see the ground much. You were flying very low and slow, just above the treetop levels, trying, looking for holes and hunting Charlie in whatever way. And in most cases, they were down there, they could see you, hear you, and of course, you weren't able to see them so much. It, so what we did was just gradually start slowing down in an area that we were working. You know, if you could um, work in a particular valley or just whatever, looking and you, you know they're down there or you think they're down there or whatever, and then you just start slowing down. And because uh, you need to slow down anyway when you're finding little holes to see what you're seeing down the, in the trip account, but you can see if you can actually see the ground or whatever. And uh, so the mission was just, you just gradually slowed down more and more. And uh, I guess you could describe it as a, being a guinea pig or, you know, we were, mm -hmm. we were there to draw fire. And in most cases, that was the only way they really revealed their position or we figured out where they were was through slowing down and uh, taking fire. How, and this, forgive me, this may be a totally stupid question, but if you're in a loach and you're observing, and I'm the enemy, don't I figure out that I can hear or see your gunships not far behind? Well, they know, but yeah, they know that you can hear the the, the cobras up way up there, just uh, just waiting around for them. above, and they you know they know the they know the mission that you're on or what's going on, mm -hmm. but they're they're at war too, and so therefore they just. They finally, at somebody, would either be somebody with a hair trigger or just, you know, whatever, uh, unload a clip on you, just thinking, well, I, by golly, I don't give a rip. I'm gonna, mm -hmm. I think I can knock this guy out of the sky. Here I am, totally vulnerable. I mean, and if he was successful, I'd go down through the trees and, and, uh, and he'd have himself a downed helicopter. And the Cobras really couldn't do much other than, you know, they're not gonna, but anyway, it's, yeah. we're, very, very vulnerable in what was, but that right. was that was the mission. Right. So uh, let's talk about because it's also interesting when we talked right bef when we before we turned on the camera. How do you fly that close to treetop, and how far off the ground? How far is that low? How low is low? Uh, um, 10, 20, 30, 40 feet depends on what how what your speed is, what your how you're maneuvering. Um, you come up to a complete hover. If you are feeling real brave for the moment, or you kind of just kind of 
you're kind of convinced that no one's around or that type of a thing. But you're always moving because that's part of your defense is, is the idea of being hard to hit. And, you know, for the whole year, you know, I mean, that was, you, you would just, um, you kept your speed up. There was a lot of maneuvering. There was some unique kind of maneuvering that we would do over a hole. You would, if in aviation terms, it would, you would describe it as a, a hammerhead stall where you would come over a hole in the trees and see it. And then about the time you, you're right on top of it and say you're doing 30 knots and you would instantly do a cyclic climb you're out of the aircraft watching, studying what down the, in the hole, you come up to, you know, maybe 150 feet above the trees that you were, and then you come right over on top, you're still observing that hole and what you're studying on the ground if you can or whatever, and then you're coming down through, falling through where you just were, and then right at the last second, do what I'd call a cyclic climb and come off and skim across the top of the trees over and you literally go back, you needed to see that hole again, you come back and you come over from a different direction and do the same thing over again. And you might do three or four of those over that same hole until you say, well, I've been on this hole too long, you, you know, I need to move on. I've seen what I wanted to see or whatever, but you're always moving. And so that split second of you're doing the climb and the hammer's head stall and the fall right through before you do your climb, uh, your cyclic climb to pull out, You've got four, seven, ten seconds of being able to observe that hole. Okay. What are you looking? Let's talk about two. Well, first of all, how do you not crash into trees if you're that close to them? I mean, they're say. Uh... Well, you know, the top of the trees is is your barrier. Just if you were working off as flat ground or anything else, okay. you you know, that's just part of it. And that was one of the unique things about this aircraft. Like I said before, I mean, it's so responsive. It's just. I mean, it was a kick in the ass to, to fly. Yeah. I mean, it was just, here I am, 21 years old, yeah. I'm out here and I'm flying a hot little machine. In most cases, we were pretty grossed out weight-wise from three people, load of fuel, and uh, we had a, carried a box full of grenades and Willie Peets and uh, smoke grenades and all that stuff. So we were heavy until we ran out some of our fuel. But nevertheless, it was a, a well-built, wonderful aircraft to fly. Yeah, what uh, what do you look? How do you see the enemy? What do you are you are you going off intelligence? And then when we when we also talked a little, you told me about what you look for, even what you smell for. Get, walk me through. How do you know when you found them under triple canopy? Because you can't. They're just. It's not like soldiers out in a field. It's well, again, you you know they would shoot at you, if, but a lot of times you there would be little cuts in there on a creek or whatever, what we call a blue line. And you could see the crick, and if it was perfectly clear, and you know, and there maybe you find a trail going across, and it was still perfectly clear, um, you know. And I'm 150 feet above because the trees are that tall, but you can figure it out, you know, day after day after day. You you you're a scout. You learn to read these signs, and you can say no one has traveled on this trail today. But there might be footsteps and stuff. Well, yesterday there was traffic or, or whatever, that type of a thing. And what you're observing, you're constantly talking to one of the uh, uh, co-pilots of the, usually the lowest of the three co Cobras. Um, and he's writing down on the sectional map that he's following right here, little notes and that kind of thing of what I'm seeing. And eventually that information gets back to uh, headquarters, either we're you know, sometimes in the evening I would go brief uh, the colonels and generals and that kind of stuff on what I saw. Not very often, but that, that was, whatever I saw eventually made it up to, to some, somewhere yeah. you know, every day. Yeah. What are, are you looking for, um, when you see down, can you see, can you actually see camps? Can you see, uh, uh, what, what are some of the things that you see? You talk about seeing trails. You talk about seeing, what are, what are some of the other signs you look for? Well, you wouldn't really see camps so much because of the visibility was so poor. I mean, you would smell uh, campfire smoke. You may not see any smoke, but um, the jungle was had such a beautiful, uh, perfect, rich, uh, pure smell of humidity 
and trees, I don't know how to describe it, any sort of a whiff of anything foreign would you'd pick up. Your nose are in the air all the time. I mean, you're just, you know, you got three pairs of noses in the wind all the time and you pick up whatever. And you'd campfire smell. You're out in the middle of Charlie's country and you smell campfire smoke. Well, Charlie's underneath you somewhere right there. And um, also, Real stagnant air a lot of times if there was a, a bunch of them or whatever, they traveled through, you, I, I can remember often being able to smell uh, body odor. Mm -hmm. um, they also, they smoked a lot of pot, so you would get whiffs of pot smoke uh, up through the trees or something. Those were indications of the smell that um, you would get. Not very often, but you know, that was just one of those things. I mean, it might be just a split second thing of, of a whiff and you don't smell it again, but that whiff came from somewhere and it's underneath you. And so that that was just so one of those. So detection by smell, you wouldn't think of it, but det you could actually detect them by smell. Yes, exactly. Yeah, huh. I mean, you got 25 people down there that haven't seen a shower in a month and, and they've, you know, they've been living in, you know, it's like they gotta be hurting. Right, right. Well, and, and also you're you're bringing up some air. I mean, you've got a lot of air circulating around you. Well, yeah, but you're moving along, so you're talking about rotor wash or whatever, right. but not so much. But it's just it whatever it is, you know. You know, if you had cattle underneath there, you would have you'd smell cat. cattle, you know, manure and stuff. So it was just that kind of a thing. Yeah. Did you? Uh, so you would go back. How long would you on on a day on a mission? Would you run one a day? Would you? How often are you running these missions, and how long do they last? Well, we in the morning you get up, or maybe the evening before you'd have a briefing. You knew where you were going to go. Maybe back to the same area that you were before. Just continue on down. And you would just uh, get up in the morning and fuel up. You'd have breakfast by 5.36, the sun was up. And uh, you would go out and take off maybe by 7 or 7.30. And you'd go out to wherever your area is that you were gonna go. Um, and um, the fuel loads were somewhere right like an hour and a half, and there would be fire bases out there, different places. Usually, just a, there was a couple in where I usually, but they had fuel and uh, relatively secure area, or not so secure, but still there was fuel available. <laughs> and uh, you would stop there and fuel up. So, if you want to call it a sortie, every fuel, you would probably fuel up anywhere from five, six, seven times a day on a long day until sundown or soon. Once the dome got, jungle got too dark, the sun was too low, my mission didn't do any good. So we'd usually head back by, you know, when the sun was low in the sky or whatever. Right. You're done for the day. But you'd been at it for 10, 12 hours of, you were, of, of combat, I mean, flying. Yeah, you're, you're ready to. Oh, sure, you get ready to go back and, you know, yeah. take a cold shower. Right. Did you um, uh, did you fly every day? Is that part of? Yeah, we really did. Okay. We 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 really did. There was once in a while there would be weather or high winds, but not very often. And the the winter was the monsoon season, and there was days where it was the fog was pea soup. You couldn't get anywhere. The rain was so heavy that yes, you did have days off where no one moved. You couldn't do anything. I mean, and. Uh, so there, there was a day, but in the, the eight months in the drier season from March through, you know, say November or whatever, you, you went every day. Was that, um, uh, when it was nice, you were over there doing what you like, I mean, you were flying, you were fulfilling a, a childhood dream. Did you, did it live up to your expectations? Oh, I suppose so. You know, I don't know about me thinking, you know, I was, you know, doing a mission, and I, you know, I don't know. I, I, I was supposed so. I mean, I, you know, it was good for me. Mm -hmm. I, it gave me a direction. I matured quite a few many years quicker than say my buddies back here mm -hmm. that were still figuring out what they do after high school. And here I am already through flight school and and in heavy combat. So, um, but it worked out. Right. Did you fly with the same uh, uh, crew chief and and uh, observer every day in the same in the same helicopter? No, we had 
several, you know, we had close to 10 loaches. Although we were losing them all the time, we were probably not more than average, more than six or seven at a time. Um, but, uh, you know, I would, we had several favorite, I had several favorite, we got along well or, you know, we clicked or whatever, but there was usually kind of a turnaround. There was either somebody was sick or, um, taking a day off, or it was a mechanic that was going to stay back and do this. They all got breaks. I think they got more breaks than we did. But it, you know, we, you know, I had a, some pretty sharp young kids. The thing was that they were 18 years old, and I was barely 21 years old, so they were younger. <laughs> right, that made you the old man. Uh, yeah, <laughs> but, but not so much, you know. Yeah. But I mean, it was. I had some pretty sharp young kids, you know, straight out of high school or not high school. Well, they had to be in high school to get into the army, but. Anyway, it was, um, there was some pretty, we had fun too. I mean, there was some good friends. Um, you never really got very close, but you did, you know, you were with these guys every day. And, you know, I remember one young kid was just real sharp, young black kid. I mean, and I, coming from Billings, I didn't have much association with uh, black people, but he just impressed the heck out of me. I mean, I remember him. So, you know, one of the nicer guys that I got to work with, and we worked together a lot. He was just an observer, you know, probably 18 years old. I have no idea, you know. But right. It was, you know, he was a lot of neat people. Yeah. So let's talk about, uh, do you remember the first time someone shot back at you? Because that had to be probably, I would imagine, a, a sobering experience. It's one thing to learn how to fly and to fly maneuvers. It's another thing to be shot at. Well, I don't remember the first time. Maybe I got shot at the first time when I was still the first week working with the other, one of the you know older um, pilots. But we got shot at all the time. I mean, you know, there was days that, as far as I know, I didn't get shot at, but I couldn't hear anything. But, but we got shot at a lot, and we took hits a lot, and so um, that was kind of a, a common thing. Okay. I mean, you know, the minute you took fire, you heard the cracks, uh, you know, an AK-47, uh, 100 yards or less down below you uh, or shorter distance, it makes a pretty good good crack. And it, of course, it's instantly you're wired to that sound. And of course, if you're feeling uh, being taken hits at the same time, so with it, what would go on is I, my observer in the back, he was a crew chief, he had an M60 that was um, hanging off a bungee cord. Uh, it's a machine gun, you know, and uh, he would return fire, but in his hand he had a red uh, smoke grenade with the pin already pulled. And the instant we took fire, no matter what went on, he instantly dropped it right direct below us, so we had a reference of where I was when I took fire. And of course, within 10 seconds, it would usually filter up through the jungle enough for the cobras to, to, to lock on where I got. And I was describing what I had heard or direction from where the, the red smoke was. The red smoke just basically gave you a point of reference. Um, and instantly, you would take off and say, taking fire, taking fire, you know, and you get off. And in the triple canopy jungle, they're not going to be able to see you for very long. You know? Right. And you're you're gone out. Maybe you go back in and see if you can see where the fire came from or whatever. You know, if it was just one guy shooting at you or whatever that type of thing. But usually, the cobras are there, hot to trot, and they would roll in and open up with their their mini guns and their rockets and stuff. And then I would go back in and see what I can see. By that time, everybody's pissed down on the ground and they're, they're, they're ready for, for war. And, and so the rest of the day was working with those people on the ground. Yeah. So that once they, once they kind of gave up where they were, then, then we went after them. Well, they wouldn't give up. You know, they're just, you know, they're sitting there in a foxhole or whatever it is. I right. Mean, but, it, you know, uh, but once they gave away their position, I meant. Well, yeah. exactly. Yeah. yeah, and then we had a we had our little war for the day, or whatever right. it might be. Is is and uh, if there was a significant amount or whatever, we'd soon call in. Uh, they'd call in uh, uh, fast movers. They were usually the F four jet okay. from uh, Da Nang. Um, 
and or there was always an uh, air, um, aircraft carrier off the coast. We worked with the, the Navy quite a bit. So, you know, if there was, pretty soon you'd have, a, you know, the jets in the sky and, and uh, you'd have a CNC, which is a command control helicopter up in the sky, kind of running things. And, you know, they'd roll in and then I'd go back down and see what I could see. Maybe there'd be a body count, maybe, you know, whatever. But, mm. um, you know. Were, were the were the Loaches pretty good at taking, I mean, because if they're always getting shot at, are they pretty good about taking bullets and, and hits? Yeah, uh, pretty much, yeah, they are. They were well built. But, you know, a bullet in the engine, um, you know, stops an engine usually, fuel control, turbine blade, something of that sort. Yeah, I, lead just doesn't mix with the turbine. There were several times I got, you know, bullet holes through the fuel cells and, you know, that type of thing. Uh, bullet holes in transmissions, you lose your blood, your, uh, the oil in the transmission. Uh, in that case, you quickly limp home. The transmissions were built to, to run for a period of time without oil. Um, and that saved me going down several times due to that one thing as far as you know, right. the transmission getting... Yeah, so these are these are these are aircraft that have a short field life. I'm getting the. I mean, if they're drawing that much, uh, that, that could have a short field life. They didn't. Yes. Um, yeah, I don't know how many. Um, the military had a term called Red X. If there was a, a maintenance problem where it wasn't flying until it got fixed, it was known as a Red X. And there was a lot of aircraft. That I um, the ones that survived on the way home. Uh, where they were red X permanently, you get bullet holes, particularly the 51 caliber, the larger bullet, through the superstructure, and of course the aircraft is shot. I mean, there's it's structurally not sound anymore, and it would go stick over there in the pasture, you know, line mm -hmm. up with the other ones that would never fly again. Hmm. Um, so. Well, let's talk about um, what's the. Uh, are, are you so busy? Do you do you think about home a lot when you're over there? Do you miss home? Oh, I suppose I did. I think you just you know after a while you get kind of detached. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean you're focused on what you're doing seven days a week, and um, like I said, I was married, so I got a letter on occasion, um, sent a letter on occasion, but. Um, but I don't, you know, I don't, I don't really remember that. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was, I think you get so, you're halfway around the world, mm -hmm. and I think you just kind of lose detachment. Uh, the, the music, the good rock and roll, yeah. back in the, the, the late 60s, um, that's one of my fond memories is the music that what, I, we what, listened to. What music did you remember listening a lot to? Or are there songs today that take kind of well, take you, you back? Well, you at? hear, you know, I mean, Cream, you know, yeah. Jimi Hendrix, you know, Dylan. I mean, you can just go on and on. Yeah. Uh, the early Rolling Stones. I mean, you can go on and on. Uh, Santana. I mean, you just. Right. So all of that, all of that kind of can take you back. But it was, we, we, was we, it also kind of support while you were over there? Too? Yeah, you very had much so. Because it, it's a, a, a connection of home. Uh, there was the radio uh, program uh, that you got piped in, uh, known as, you know, Radio Vietnam, or I don't remember what it was. But the, the music was just pure good old rock and roll from that era. And it was just, that was the music that we listened to. And we would, it was just always part of our life. And then the nostalgia, I mean, I yeah. can, I hear a song and it's like, I can remember listening to that in the bunkers you know, huh. and stuff, so. Well, did you, because I've, I've always heard that the enemy loved firing at anything that flew, namely hel a lot of helicopters that they'd take shots at. Did that make it, when you were on the ground back in the uh, base, did that make it, you guys, a target? Cause, because there, I can see all these aircraft lined up and thinking that, that must have been a real gold mine of a target or well you know there was a perimeter around uh Fubair or the air base and well mained by you know ground pounders that took care of us you know i mean mm -hmm. our job was to stay up all night and watch for charlie and the wire and uh and there was constantly stuff no not every night and everything but you know there was they would try to get through the wire there's mm -hmm. every once in a while we'd have incoming where we'd run for a bunker and spend 30 minutes while it blows over or whatever, they figure, well, no one hit it, you know, 
that type of thing. Mm -hmm. So, but it was you really pretty relaxed. I mean, you you definitely let yourself down when you got home, and and you were up at five the next morning and headed out to do the same thing again. So on occasion, most of the time, it was real hard to sleep. Yeah, because your imagination and in the adrenaline rush and and the anticipation of going back to the same area tomorrow when you know they ate your lunch or you know I mean yeah you were there so it was just you know you were you kind of ran on adrenaline and a lot yeah I was gonna say it'd be hard to wind down especially after 12 days and maybe getting shot and then you're up really early too you don't get to sleep in yeah and you know the environment there was very hot and humid, uh, uncomfortable, no air conditioning. So you you lived in a sweaty environment. Uh, it was so humid. Uh, you know you swap boots, uh, pairs of boots, because in a couple days they'd have a quarter inch of green uh, uh, mold growing on the boots. Uh, so you every day you put on a new pair of boots, or rather the, your other two or three pair, and you just rotated them to keep the from. You leave a boot for a week, and it was overcome with mold, and because they were always wet and soggy, and and that sort of thing. It was just, um, you know. Yeah. Anyway, it sounds it sounds just yeah, not very much fun, especially different than Montana. Of course, you know I, I mean, going to Alabama after Montana was a unique uh, deal, and then and then you know, headed over there was, but at, at the age of, you know, when you're so young, you you really do accommodate and and mm -hmm. get used to it and. Uh, it's you know you had an attitude, right? <laughs> yeah. so. I imagine so. Well, uh, how would you describe your attitude over there? I, you know, as I was surviving, you know, I was like making it. You know, after all the times I went down and everything, I, you had a, you had to have an attitude that I fly well enough. I'm good at what I'm doing, and it's going to be somebody that really knows what they're doing to knock me down. You know, I did get knocked down, but I mean, it was, you know, I had a cocky 21-year-old attitude of, you know, you're going to have to be good to get me. And, right. and, and I'm sure it was sort of a survival type thing. And, you know, every day you came home and you still had your arms and legs and, and, and whew, you know, I made it through that deal or, or whatever it might be. And, uh, and so, yeah, I, I'm sure had a pretty normal attitude you had to have something because either that or you'd be you know you know, you 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 constantly i'm sure running scared like you know there was a lot of fear involved right. you know yeah. so because i mean you didn't know i mean we always had new pilots coming in loach pilots because we were always losing loach pilots you know sometimes they don't even last a month or two and they didn't show up after a day of being out in the AO. So you went through that a lot. You just, you were always lo losing these people that I was drinking with last night and, you know. That's, so that's why you don't get too close to anyone. Well, over there you didn't, you know. And I'm, I think, I'm sure there are a lot of people that remember names and brought, you know, addresses and mm -hmm. that type of thing. For whatever reason, I, when I got back on the Freedom Bird after a year and a half, or a year, excuse me, exactly 365 days, I, Washed my hands of it. I survived, and I I headed home. I mean, it was. How many times were you shot down? I went down four times. Okay, can you tell me about those times? Um, I can't remember which was the first one time. Um, let's say, well, one of the times. I was um, supporting a crack Vietnamese uh, uh, unit, a company, uh, probably, th you know, th let's say three platoons or, uh, uh, and um, they had an Australian advisor and I was out close to the Ashaw Valley, which was a pretty famous valley that I knew quite a bit about and I haven't got, got into that yet. And I was um, working working with them, had been working all day, it was nice working with the Australian advisor, he had somebody to communicate with on the ground. Normally that didn't happen too much, but, because uh, you were usually out on your own doing your own thing and not supporting uh, a group, particularly the Vietnamese. But these guys were great, I'd worked with them before. And so, um, 
Anyway, they had been uh, searching for a company of NVA. They were knew they were close, and they just were not connecting. And so I was out there to support them for the day, and maybe halfway through the day, um, I had found them, and I knew they were there, and I, you know, and all of a sudden, it was kind of a clear area. I mean, the, the trees were gone. It was a lot of high ferns and smaller trees, so I couldn't see the ground or anything. And so I was a little bit closer, and all of a sudden, and I was pretty slow, and um, all of a sudden, somebody let loose with a clip of AK right underneath me and just filled the aircraft with bullet holes. The engine instantly quit. The engine out beeper uh, horn instantly went off. And I didn't have much momentum, probably wasn't doing 30 knots. And luckily the hill fell off and to the direction of the people I was, uh, which would only have been 100 yards or more, um, fell off to the right if I remember right. And, and went and auto-rotated uh, to the top of the trees. And I think I probably moved 100 yards from where I took the hit to coming through the top of the trees. And uh, in an auto-rotation, what you do is your engine failure or whatever, or when you're practicing, uh, you, um, you get the pitch out of the blades so the air falling through the blades keeps the rotor turning at the RPM that it normally runs. And so you've got all that inertia in the blades for some energy to cushion your fall and cushion your landing. So basically what you did was you land to the top of the trees. The trees were at least 150 feet tall, a typical tri triple canopy. And so you land to the top of the trees. You don't want fo any forward air speed. This is all happening in about three or four seconds. Yeah. And you stop and the idea, the theory is to come back and then fall through the trees, uh, tail boom. I, it ended up that I did that again later on, but um, it takes you a couple seconds to bounce down and uh, hit the ground. Uh, I remember uh, landing upside down, uh, full of jet fuel, because the, the fuel cell had been ruptured with bullet holes. At that time, I just had an observer, which uniquely, he was on his last day of country, and he was just out for the day to fly with me to get an idea of what I did. I didn't really know the guy, but he had hit me up. Can I go flying with you for just one day? I'm leaving country tomorrow. Oh, no problem. And a couple of the aircraft had miniguns attached to it, so we didn't have an observer, so it was just two people and the minigun. In that case, that was what I was uh, flying that day. And um, so here he is, the last day in country, and I get him shot down. And uh, so anyway, we're upside down. We strap out of, get out of it, full of jet fuel, and we grab our, grab our rifles. And I know that I'm close to the friendlies, but completely disorientated. And um, and I could hear crashing from two different directions coming. And the the Australian advisor and the and uh, the South Vietnamese unit made it there first and and I got uh, rescued and uh, so within a, an hour or so uh, we headed out and w walked down this trail with a bunch of these crack Vietnamese to an area that we could they could bring a Huey in and they retrieved us and we went home and had a few beers at the bar that night Wow and um, and while that was all going on, they sent off a couple platoons. They found the guys that they were hunting. You know, they, I understand that they kicked ass and, and uh, whatever, but they were very appreciative of basically what I did was I marked the enemy with my aircraft type of a thing. Right. And, uh, and so anyway, so one of the surprise, uh, a month or two later, I had this Vietnamese DFC uh, show up at my hooch for me. The Vietnamese uh, officer came by and dropped it off, gave it to me, and thanked me for, which was a pretty inter interesting thing. The, it's a their version of uh, the distinguished flying cross, kind of a thank you of you know for whatever. Right. So, so did did um, uh, 
did getting shot down, does that scare you to get back in the cockpit again? Well, yeah, I guess, but not not so much. I'm sure you probably flew a little more cautious for a few days until that wore off. And they always gave you a day off when you got shot down. That you had a, you, you, they gave you a day off and you stayed home. Wow. So that was nice of them. Yeah. Right, you get a whole day off. <laughs> so it's anyway. a tough way to. It's a tougher way than most to earn a day off. Well, for sure, but you know they needed you, and, and we were always short of pilots and short of aircraft, and the, because of that, um, we lost so many aircraft and pilots because of that mission. Right. And uh, so, did you um, falling that far out? I mean, it must have been uh, a pretty well built helicopter to be able to. I mean. Let's say you're only 150, 200 feet above the ground, but if I jump off a building, or even if I roll a car off, it's not going to survive. I'm, I'm going to be survive. You're not right. going to survive. Well, the unique thing, yes, the aircraft was so well built. It's a structure of the uh, the strength of an egg. The way they built it and bolted the uh, transmission solid within the structure of the of the 500, the Hugh, the Loach. And it was just plexiglass, but the frame and the seat, the, the I-beams underneath your seat, the seat was made to collapse at five or six Gs, so you had three or four inches of crushability there. Um, and then you're strapped in, and we wore a chicken plate front and back be to protect our body from, you know, bullets, um, which was really heavy, so you really sat in. And then you're, you know, well-clothed, gloves, helmet, and how I survived, I don't know. I totally believe it was a, a miracle. I mean, for that whole year doing what I did, it was yeah. uh, no doubt in my mind it was, you know, a miracle. There's just, I mean, we lost so many guys in my unit that here I made it for the whole full year without being critically wounded to a point where I had to quit flying. I mean, I did it the whole right. year. What about uh, what about the other times where where the same? I know that one was in the Oshawa Valley. The other, then I'm trying to think where the other the other times. I, I know that you've received uh, commendations for those because they're pretty miraculous landings and 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 some real good piloting to get. Well, the one in Oshawa Valley was, you know, I dealt with a lot of 51 caliber, which is basically the same thing as a 50 caliber machine gun, but they call it a 51. And uh, there was a lot of those over there, and we dealt with those quite a bit. They would usually set them up on hilltops in kind of three or four at a time, pointing at, you know, where they could kind of catch you in a crossfire. And we got into the crossfires quite a bit that way. Uh, and the 50 caliber was really did do a good job in knocking the aircraft out. It was really hard on helicopters because it's such a big bullet. And. Uh, the Ashaw Valley, I worked in a lot. It was right along parallel the Laotian border, just inside Vietnam, and I spent a lot of my time out there because there was a main highway that came in from Laos into uh, the Ashaw Valley for supply and stuff. So we were out there hunting Charlie a lot. Uh, we got to know the valley. The valley was probably 40 miles long or something of that sort. I don't really remember. Uh, 30 maybe. Uh, but we knew the whole deal pretty well. But in that case, it was a 51 that knocked me down. And uh, I was a little bit higher in the air, um, rolled off the hill and went down. And I literally landed right next to that highway into some very tall, what they called um, elephant grass. It was like a rice kind of a grass, but it was 10 feet tall. I mean, it was, and, excuse me, and, Auto rotated to it. Uh, the engine went out immediately. Uh, beep, beep, beep. The engine out warning, and so I had probably 10 or 12 seconds between the time the engine went out. Um, I remember that the bullet hitting us in the engine directly. Um, it, it really, you know, it was a real bam force. I mean, it was really hit the aircraft, and. Uh, but anyway, in about 10 or 12 seconds, we were on the ground. And we had a you know, command and control. We had the several co co Cobras up there with me. And then we just, uh, within five minutes or four minutes, the Huey was down there picking uh -huh. me up. And uh, we got out and 
So, uh, I mean, to be shot down once, but to be shot down to survive four different times, you're living a, you must be living a blessed life. That's amazing. Well, you know, God had plans for me, yeah. and so I don't, I don't, you know, like I say, it was a miracle. I mean, because I was constantly coming home with. Sam didn't show up. I mean, he he got shot down, and they're looking for him, or they can't. You know, in so many cases, you're not you you do if you have a chance, but of putting people in and searching or whatever. But so often it didn't happen because there was no way of putting anybody in. You know, a lot of times the uh, the dust off uh, the medevac people would uh, rescue people. Uh, and that type of stuff, and I did a little of that kind of stuff, but, uh, you know, that wasn't our mission. You know, if you got a hold of some, you know, some situation where you could actually go in and you pull somebody out, but it was, uh, anyway, it was, like I say, it was, a, you know, I was meant to make it. Yeah. Did you, um, did you ever wonder when you're going, I mean, in those 10, 12, 3, 4, however long a time you have when you're going down, do you think I'm not going to make? I mean, I'm I'm falling out of the air. I'm not going to make it. No, you're so well trained and you're so wired to that. You know, that's what you think about when you're down there. You're you're in the AO, and it, what if I my engine shot left right now? What if I got shot right here? What would I do? You were just that wasn't the main thing you were thinking about, but every you were wired to that thought. What would I do? Would I go there? Would I go there? Uh, there's a tree, you know, I would have to land right there if the engine quit right now because there's no way I'm going to fly out of this or get anywhere because, you know, you go m for miles before you'd see a, a field big enough or, a, or anything. You know, it just, it's, it's going to happen. Right. And, you know, I had one mechanical problem where I had an auto rotation out close to Fubai and, and that was just a typical auto rotation, but the engine instantly quit and the diaphragm and the fuel pump uh, ruptured and instantly the engine was off and you put it down. The training, you know, we'd go out every three months and practice our auto rotations and, and that kind of stuff. So I think you're just, that's one of the things you're really on your mind. So, you know, there's, there's no second guessing. You just, uh, you know what to do and you're, the survival mode kicks in. Of course, I think you're in that mode from the minute you get out of bed to the time you Try to go to bed. Yeah. Sleep. Yeah. Did you were you injured at all? In uh, did you ever have to? Were you out of commission because of your of injuries, or had to be medevac? One of the times I really got shot up bad, I was basically blinded. Um, Fifty caliber. We caught it. Just he caught it me just perfect. I flew right over it, and he just unloaded when I was a couple hundred yards away from him and drove, flew right over and just really peppered the aircraft. Amazingly, the aircraft ran. He didn't connect with the engine, and uh, none of us were killed or really shot. I was, the cockpit was completely, uh, this plexiglass and, and, the, and the, the console and stuff got hit pretty bad. And it was a real cloudy, rainy day, so I had my visor uh, up to see, you know, the darkness uh, in the tr in the jungle, and uh, I was basically blinded. And um, but we taught our observers how to fly well enough to take the aircraft home. You know, you're flying along, so basically you're just flying. You're not trying to hover or anything else. You're just flying. And you know, I wasn't totally blinded, but you know, I was. If it hadn't been for the observer being trained, you know, I don't know, we wouldn't have made it. And we, you know, so the reason why we trained it in case the pilot was shot, which I guess in this case I was, at least through the shrapnel, um, he brought us back to Fubai and just kind of made a running landing on the airstrip and uh, it was close to the, air, air, the um, hospital which I'd brought other people in at times, you know, that type of thing. But anyway, I was in a, a bed for a few hours while they were um, picking out the shrapnel in my face and my eyeballs were full of it. And uh, luckily I was not, you know, it was all superficial when it all came and done. And that's, I guess, how you, I got my Purple Heart. Wow. 
did you think that you may have lost? I mean, you can't see. You know you've been hit. Do you think, oh, my God, I'm not going to see again? I mean, because this is uh, – you, you, you can't not be – you can't be a, pilot, a blind pilot. Well, I don't remember that at all. Okay. I don't really remember other than the scene of when I – everything blew up from me. And I was clear out in the northern part of the Ashaw. So, I mean, it was at least a 30-minute drive – or, I mean, fl flight back, you know, they were escorting me, and the observer did the fly-in, and, and uh, I mean, to this day, I don't remember who it was. I mean, we just taught all our observers to fly well enough that they could, you know, it was a survival thing on their part. Right. I'd hate to lose two good people just because I got shot and couldn't fly. Yeah. So we you know, we trained the observer, and he flew back, and and I got another day off, and never went back. <laughs> right. I'm sure I was off for a few days because of, of what went on with my face, uh, and you know, my one eye I was real bloodshot for a while. But anyway, did it, wor your, it worked out. Did your family know you were injured at the time? You know, I don't remember. I don't think I said much about what was going on. Okay. You know, I probably just whitewashed whatever was going on. Right. You know, why, why? Didn't matter, you know. Yeah. What did you? Um, what were the good times in Vietnam? What were they like? Well, I. There was a lot of good times. I mean, you know, you you dealt with your environment, and when you weren't in combat, you were, uh, you know, smoking and joking and just having a good time. And you had good buddies, and like I say, the music was phenomenal. Uh, I remember. We had we lived in little small Quonset huts, uh, uh, corrugated metal things. You know, all, most farmers' uh, ranches have Quonset huts, bigger ones. Uh, you know, for their their equipment and when they on harvest time they fill the Quonsets full of wheat temporarily and that type of thing. But anyway, we would have six seven guys in each Quonset hut. The Marines actually build them. It was a Marine base at Fubai before uh, the 101st which was who I was flying for, the 101st Airborne. Um, so the Quonset right next door was a, a Huey company, uh, you know, several pilots. And instead of having individual little rooms that we build out of rocket uh, uh, carts, you know, the, the wood out of rocket uh, uh, crates, they had a run great big room with a phenomenal stereo system and black lights and, and posters and. It sounds like a dorm room. It was a dorm room. I mean, a great big dorm room, and uh, so that's how you, you know, let yourself down and, and unwind and, you know, so. Did they have cold beer in Vietnam? Uh, occasionally, but not so much. We we learned to drink uh, uh, rusty can. Back then, they were made, the cans were steel, so they rusted a lot, and so warm, rusty cans was the norm. Did you get any beer of a label you recognized? There's some feelings among vets that they anything that couldn't sell in the States was shipped over to Well, that's probably the truth. You know, I don't, uh, you know, I don't remember that. Right. You know, um, I, I, I'm, sh yeah. you know, if I saw the cans or whatever, it would be, you, you know, be I, would, oh, I, would, I would remember that. Right. I just remember rusty cans, you know, and I, rem you know, so anyway. How did you, um, uh, were there uh, flights where you couldn't believe that you stayed airborne? Not, not so much the ones that you went down on, but were there ones that you said, I don't know how I'm, how this thing is still flying? Yeah. There was more times I I, I limp, uh, limped home. Okay. Yeah, I mean, uh, whistling blades, bullets, uh, holes in the blades. Uh, some of the blades, when we finally got back, you wonder how the heck they stayed together. Um, um, no oil in transmissions, bullet holes in, and tail rotor drive uh, shaft. Uh, you know, just a lot of that went went on. I mean, it, and so, yeah, you know, the, the Hughes was a well-built aircraft. And, you know, so, yeah, we, I, I don't remember how many times I limped home. You know, everyone with a different degree, sometime you come home. At the end of the day, you know, you got a couple bullet holes you didn't even realize you had. You would right. flew all day long uh, or whatever. Um, 
did you inspect the aircraft? I mean, how, how did you tell? Uh, was there a pretty thorough inspection process after you landed to make sure to come? Yeah, you, you had your mechanic on board who was your door gunner, basically what, what he was, but he was also the mechanic for the aircraft, at least for that day. Yeah, and it was in perfect shape when we left, or close to perfect, or flyable. Right. And, uh, and then at the end of the day, of course, you could go through, but it's a small aircraft, doesn't take long, you either survived or you didn't, or this, this can fly tomorrow, or this isn't going anywhere, that type of a thing. Right, let's talk about leaving Vietnam. When did when was your time up, and what was leaving Vietnam like for you? Well, it was pretty spectacular, I guess. Um, eventually, you know, the last month in country, I was, you know, an old guy, and I had kind of a reputation. I mean, I was kind of a phenomenon to still be alive and still, you know, going out every day with my my record and whatever, but anyway, by the last month, things slowed down for me a little bit, and I was, they were having me be more of a maintenance officer for the, for the loaches, but I still was doing some combat, but the last month our company was out in a place called Quezon that was way out close to the Laos border. The, the Marines had been there for several years earlier during Tet and that kind of stuff, out in the middle of nowhere. Somehow, for some reason, they, you know, in all their wisdom, they decided they were gonna go out there and take the place up again. And so the last month I was out there, uh, living in a bunker under the ground, and, um, you know, count my days. And uh, it was, uh, you know, pretty unique to, but again, the music was wonderful. We had a ghetto blaster underneath in the ground and uh, uh, listen to music at night. You'd do combat all day long and then go down underneath the ground and of course the perimeter's right there. Every night there's combat in the, and dinks in the wire, which was a term we called for the Charlie or, you know, the North Vietnamese right. uh, NVA. And every morning you get up and there'd be, you know, dead bodies in the Constantina wire. And the 50 calibers and everything going on off above your head, we're down safe and sound underneath because we, you know, we work during the day and were protected at night due to, and so you listen to that quite a bit. But as things got closer and closer, you know, I would, the last week I'm sure I wasn't out there much of anything. And then all of a sudden you had the day that you, you, you were packing your bags and it was actually gonna happen. You weren't in the AO anymore, you were done, and you, maybe a couple days of, you know, waiting for the clock to ring where you jump on a, a C C-130 or whatever it is to get down to uh, Saigon. And, uh, and I remember, you know, seeing the big old Boeing 707 sitting there, what we called or referred to as a Freedom Bird. Yeah. And uh, so, you know, I remember, you know, walking across the tarmac and um, in my very tired looking um, you know, pilot clothes, you know, you know, and uh, flight suit and, and that, and uh, getting on that bird and you're like, whew. Yeah, what was it like getting on that and, fly and leaving Vietnam? Well, you know, I don't really remember. It's pretty foggy. I just know that, you know, thank the Lord it was, I, I, I survived and I had all my arms and legs and, and, yeah. uh, and I was, coming back to to Billings and I remember making it back to Fort Lewis there outside of Seattle and and uh, spending one day to kind of go through the paperwork or whatever and getting on Northwest or, or Northwest Airlines uh, wearing my you know my greens whatever there you know the uh, your dress up greens for the army and uh, having the stores buy a few drinks on the way from, at that time there was a flight from Seattle straight to Billings and so I landed in Billings and my wife at the time, you know, there and folks. And so that, that was a good homecoming? Yeah, I, yeah. You know, I remember the airport was pretty empty. There was hardly anybody there. 
you know, I mean, it was just, I think just family. And I, I really hardly remember. I mean, yeah. it was just a... When you were getting short, was that a... Um, did you... Uh, I know a lot of guys said, I don't want to put myself... I've, I've made it this far. I'm not putting myself in in harm's way. Not, not you know, n not obstinately, but they were more guarded. Were you more guarded as you got shorter? Because I they would, put, they I would assume so. You know, the last couple of weeks or the last month or something, you know, you, you wouldn't s possibly not stick yourself out. But at the same time, there was a mission. And of course, I, like I said, I had an attitude, you know. Right. I, you know, I, I would made it so far. There's no reason for me not to make it or whatever, you know. And so, um, again, it's pretty foggy. Right. Did, does four, uh, does being shot down four times make you more cocky or less? I don't think, I wouldn't think that. It was just that <clears throat> as you, it happens, no mm -hmm. matter, you know, the cockiness just was a survival thing. Sure. You know, it sure as heck didn't make you any more t able to survive. One bullet in the body, uh, you, you know, you're done or whatever that might be. But it was a f survival mode, mm -hmm. you know. It was self-preservation personally or, you know, an attitude. And it's, it, it was a way you su su survived, I would assume. Mm -hmm. Emotionally. Tell me about, um, uh, you said something interesting, I think it was before the camera came on, that when you were done with Vietnam, you did not want to put on an, a uniform again. Is that correct? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it was, again, an attitude. I, I did very well, you know, flight school, combat, that kind of military, you know. But coming back to what I would refer to as spit and polish, mm -hmm. which was, you know, back then the military required you to, stateside to have shiny boots and looking uh, like a million bucks and and the idea of I had an obligation of two more years after a flight school and a tour in Vietnam my agreement or my contract was two more years of stateside and uh, you know I, I could have easily been sent back again you know type of thing but I was a warrant officer and uh, by that time at W-2, and uh, after a full year of that, they had so many warrant officers and things were slowing down and that type of thing. They were, that it was like, you know, if you want an early out, you've done your deal, sign on the dotted line, and I jumped to that. So when I got out of Vietnam, out of Fort Lewis, I was, I was done with the military, and, uh, and I didn't want to. But, Getting back to Billings and kind of whatever, I did not want to go back you know, military or whatever, but it didn't take me but six months with a few Hueys flying over from the National Guard, that type of thing, and it was like, she whiz. Yeah, you gotta be, it, I got to be, I got to fly. And by that time, my hair was long and curly and blonde, and I was, you know, starting to heal up. I, I really did have a good case of what I would require, require uh, I recall, um, shell shock. Back then they called it a shell shock, I guess. Right. I, that's what I referred to. Where firecrackers and slamming screen doors and that kind of stuff which just, you know, sets you, set you off. But you eventually start calming down. Yeah. And uh, so eventually it was like I joined the Montana Guard so I could fly. And uh, so for the next 10 years until the spring of 81, I flew in the guards just to keep my hand in it. Mm -hmm. Did you have a hard time getting, was it hard getting back to civilian life? Because you, you would have been through some pretty intense 12 hour days, combat, flying. Uh, that's pretty intense. And then just to kind of work back into civilian life, was it hard? Yeah, I'm sure it was. You know, to, I don't remember much about it, but it, it just, it would, it, logic would say, yes, you know, you go from this environment where you're and then all of a sudden, here I am coming back to my hometown. I got all my high school buddies, you know, I mean, whatever. And so for me, it was real good because I come right back to the same environment. I've only been gone for a couple of years and I just kind of pick up where I left off. You know, I had all, all these friends that were still partying and being wild and crazy and hadn't done diddly squat. And, right. and I'm back, you know, two and a half years of going through the military and what I'd gone through and stuff to come back and 
And so maturity-wise, I'm sure I was a lot more. I went into business for myself, uh, installing garage doors within a matter of several months afterwards. I flew for that, uh, that, after, that summer on a fire contract for some people here in Billings, which didn't really work out very well, but it, it was an opportunity. But then by that fall, I would, had joined the, the National Guard to be a weekend warrior just to keep my hand in. Uh, right. And you still, uh, then you also flew, uh, you, you, you kept flying, right? You, you didn't hang up your helicopter pilot's license or? No, I've got a career in flying, uh, solid, um, between the guards. I was a contractor in Billings here, installed garage doors, and then I was an installation contractor for the last five years, and then I went to work for uh, an individual known as Gerhardt Blaine, mm -hmm. and uh, it was a great opportunity working with him. Uh, I started like in 1980, flying commercial utility work, uh, fires and seismic work and that type of stuff. And I just started flying uh, solid for different people up through the years. And helicopters, Alaska, through about 88, and then came home and flew fixed wing out of Billings, flying freight for a company known as Corporate Air for 15 years. And that was great, you know, 15 years of flying single pilot freight uh, planes was great. Things uh, changed a little bit and I went back and worked for uh, Gerhard Blaine's uh, boys, um, Gary and Al, um, for several years and then worked for a company down in uh, Wyoming and Colorado. And then I retired for about four years ago. I've flown a little bit since then, off and on, but I've been out of the flying for about four years now. Right, right. Was Vietnam a good experience for you? In some ways, it was absolutely wonderful. Uh, in the idea that the Army taught me how to fly, I learned, I guess, well. And uh, it was like my college degree of here's your ticket to have a career in aviation, and that's exactly what I did. You know, so the, my dream of flying commercial and all, everything, the different things is, you know, I, I've got a pretty good story of all the different experiences and different types of flying. I've been all over the country. Uh, Alaska, I spent a lot of time in, in Alaska in the 80s, uh, fixed wing and helicopters, mostly helicopters, but uh, I even went with Gary and Al over to Sumatra when the, the big tsunami happened back uh, whenever it was, uh, I don't remember, what it was that, in 03 or 04, something like that. S sent several months over there with them with one of their machines. It was a good experience, uh, working great with those guys and stuff. So it was, so anyway, I've, you know, working in Alaska in the 80s was wonderful. Working wintertime on the North Slope, supporting offshore oil rigs, running uh, helicopters in the middle of the night, uh, sub below zero, you know, just all that kind of different experiences, so. Yeah, yeah, you've had a lot of them. That they're kind of interesting. Yeah, so. um, <clears throat> when you, uh, looking back now, hasn't quite been 50, no one likes it when I do math during these interviews, uh, almost 50 years from Vietnam, how does a guy who was over there and saw Vietnam, uh, how do you look back on it now? Um, with not much emotion, I don't think about it much unless I run into a veteran and, mm -hmm. you know, it's obvious to me that he's my age and, and then I was struck of a conversation and got stories or just, or whatever. That I don't think about it much. Okay. But maybe I do just in the back, you know, type of a thing, because it was a big deal. But, you know, that was a long time ago. You yeah. know, so I've had a wonderful life uh, since then. And uh, Yeah. Did you, uh, did you only fly basically over there? Were you only flying loaches, or did you fly Hueys, or did you? No, ever I, the full year was loaches. That's okay. my mission, and that's what I like to do. Uh, I flew in the Cobras a little bit just for a ride type of right. thing, and uh, the Hueys. Uh, of course, I knew Hueys from flight school, so it was not. But my mission was loach, and I, you know, I stuck with it because, like I said, you know, I thought I was good at it, and. So far, I was surviving, and, and uh, so. 
Yeah. What, what's Vietnam like? I mean, it's one thing we've heard a lot of guys talk about Vietnam from the ground, jungles, um, bunkers, and you certainly shared some of that. What's it like from the air flying just above the triple canopy? What's your impression of Vietnam? Vietnam is a beautiful country. I mean, I'd love to go over and spend a couple of weeks and run around on a dirt bike somewhere in, in that same area. But uh, beautiful, green country. Uh, the people that I met, some of the military, you know, superficially, I enjoyed. They were nice, friendly, you know, you know. Um, it was just, it's beautiful country. I mean, it's just, you know, it, it's too bad that we, we won the war, we won the, the battles, but we lost the war, you mm -hmm. know, and to get political, uh, you know, the generals were controlled by uh, the politicians and the generals were not allowed to do, in my opinion, what generals are made and trained to do, and that's why we walked away and lost that war, you know. We left Vietnam and then Congress uh, decided to unfund or defund uh, South Vietnam and they couldn't handle uh, the communists uh, after we're gone. So anyway, we, we gave up. I mean, it was a, not a good thing at all. Yeah. Was it hard to see the fall of Saigon? Yeah, sure. I mean, it was, you know, it was like, gee whiz, all for naught. What was it, 58,000 mm -hmm. of us uh, were killed over there and, and something like, 5,300 or 5,400 pilots were killed in Vietnam in that yeah. many years. I mean, I, I'm pulling those numbers out of my head, but I think it was, um, you know, 5,000. You know, the, in, during flight school, you know, uh, the flight school I went through, they were putting out 500 pilots every two weeks. I mean, uh, the Army was mass producing helicopter pilots. I mean, it yeah. was... Uh, they, they had a real thing going. I mean, it, yeah, uh, 500, that, that's amazing. 1,000 every month, just strictly from Fort Rucker. And they had over in Georgia, I, I, and I'm not familiar with that, but they were putting out pilots too. But I think Fort Rucker was putting out close to 1,000 new pilots every month. Hmm. So we were a dime a dozen. We were just, yeah. You know. Wow, that is a, it's a lot. I mean, when you just start doing the math on that, you know, that, that's amazing. Well, uh, when, you're, when you look uh, now looking forward, one of the things that we ask folks when they're in here is what do you hope people in 50, 75 years who might l be able to listen to this interview, hopefully they still have the same, uh, that, that they have a format that they can get to this, what do you hope they remember about Vietnam from a guy who is over there? Oh, to me, we started out with the right kind of attitudes uh, as far as slowing and stopping the communists, although it's a known fact that the United States pretty much provoked us uh, to get it started um, out, uh, what is it, I forget the name of the bay was out there that happened, but anyway, um, but by the end of the war, it was so p political and we were not allowed to fight the war, like, you know, at the last we were literally getting shot at and have it required to call in and ask permission, which didn't happen much. I mean, it was like, you know, but it was, the year I was there, it really changed from uh, the way we were, we were allowed to fight the war. And I, I'm sure it got worse and worse the last year or so that after I left. So, um, you know, you know, I think pretty much, uh, Wars are started by, you know, the, the big bankers. They're, that's how they make their money. They supply, they, um, they finance both sides of it, and, you know, it's, that's the way the world runs. Yeah, yeah. So, so. Uh, when, one of the things that's hard about these interviews is you take, well, you take a year, even a year, but you went in, you spent more time when you consider the training of experience and try to condense them into this very small interview. That's a hard thing to do. What have I missed about your story that we need to preserve? Well, I, you know, I don't know what else, you know, I could really say. Um, it was just that it's a real blessing that I survived and, and I've had a great life uh, 
since. And, you know, the Army was good to me. And, uh, um, you know, flying, you know, aviation is just a wonderful career. Yeah. You know, I mean, it's, I've done a lot, and, uh, and I'm, I'm a blessed, you know, person. Mm -hmm. be, be because of that and uh, so you know I don't so I'm not sure what else I would be able to that, to tell you for, well let me say uh, first of all it's it's been a, a and and to use a word that you just used a blessing to hear the story and and to understand what that was like because I've heard we've heard of the low uh, from a from a Huey helicopter pilot and from some other uh, door gunner who used to uh, on a Huey who talked about what a dangerous mission that was mm -hmm. um, uh, that you guys you know you weren't necessarily firing into it, but you just by being there it was a, a, a dangerous dangerous thing and so to, I, to mention that to make a compar comparison, I was, I've been always told, and I've always used it as, you know, on a platoon out in the jungle, you always had one guy out, depending on how thick the jungle was, he was either uh, 20 feet or, or, or 20 yards ahead of the platoon walking along. He was basically by himself. Real thick jungle, he might have only been uh, 10 or 15, but he was what he was called the walking point. Mm -hmm. And that's, they would consider that would be the most dangerous individual job over there in that particular type of war. And I would guess what I did as far as flying Loach, that would be kind of the com same comparison in the world of aviation of you're down there by yourself, other than the sports from the, but that would be you kind of like you're walking you're, you're I'm walking flying the bit, point a walking point flying point you're out there kind of by yourself you're on your own and you know it, a sitting duck uh, very very susceptible and you know so that that would be the comparison of you know if you could if there is a comparison as to what the infantry did as far as the, that a gentleman that walking point he was always very good at it, you know. They survived for a while, but usually they didn't, you know, or they would trade off eventually and take a break. Um, but anyway, that would be the, the yeah. kind of the comparison of what, what uh, I was able to, to do over there. And make it four times. I'm impressed. Um, he must have been one hell of a pilot. Well, I, I, I'm blessed, and I was, I, it was a miracle. Yeah, yeah, that was. Well, I appreciate it. it's 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 always good to have a miracle interview and miracle story. So, yeah. Gunner, th thank you so much, and also thank you for your service. Thanks for for doing that and you spending uh, spending that part of your life. This has been Daryl Ehrlich. I've been with Gunner Hagstrom from the with the U.S. Army from 1968 to 1971, a pilot, a Purple Heart recipient, distinguished uh, flying crosses from both the government of the United States and Vietnam, uh, South Vietnam, I should say. Uh, and I really appreciate. Uh, his stories and his service. This has been Vietnam Voices, a project of the Billings Gazette. Thanks for tuning in. Thanks for listening.